everybody this afternoon to our monthly Hungry for History program. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Luciana Spraker with the City's Municipal Archives, and we're happy to have you here in City Hall with us. Um, before we get started with today's program, I want to give you a sneak peek of our program for September. Our speaker is going to be Elizabeth DeBose. She's the Executive Director of the Oswald Island Foundation, and she's going to speak on Indigo Past and Present. That program is going to um, also be here at City Hall on Tuesday, September 17th at 3.30 p.m. And as always, that program will be free and open to the public. We just ask you to reserve your seat with us um, in the archives ahead of time. And I'll be sending out announcements about two weeks before that, but it'll be September 17th. Um, so moving on today, um, Tomichichi, friend and ally of the Georgia colony. I'm happy to have my good friend and ally, Roger, Roger Smith, with us. Um, Roger serves as director of the Learning Center at Senior Citizens, Inc. He does a fabulous job of putting together their programming, and I often steal his speakers after I've heard them speak um, over there. So um, thanks for that, Roger. Um, Roger's a native of Savannah. He taught American literature and French language and culture at the high school level before he went on to serve as the museum educator for Massey Heritage Center. He directed the statewide history education programs at Georgia Historical Society. And then in 2006, he joined the staff at Senior Citizens, Inc., where he established the Learning Center, which is a humanities education program for people ages 55 and over. And he lets some of us who haven't quite reached that milestone sneak in as well. And um, we're real, I'm really excited to have him here for our presentation today. So thank you, Roger. I will take being an ally of Luciana any day of the week. That is absolutely gold because what she didn't mention to you is that while I'm very flattered to be invited from time to time to speak here in our beautiful city hall, Luciana is always so generous with her time and her expertise in our program as well. In fact, she's going to be giving a talk for us in our uh, fall term that's coming up um, in, in just a little bit of time. So I'm looking forward to having her back on, on our turf again. Luciana mentioned that um, I'm a native of Savannah, and I know some of you may be in that category. Some of you may have lived here long enough to feel as if you're in that category. And so therefore, I hope that the name of the subject of the talk today is imminently familiar to all of you. Uh, I know that certainly during my time um, as uh, educator at Massey Heritage Center, followed by several years as Director of Education for the Georgia Historical Society. Tomachichi, Oglethorpe, Mary Musgrove, all of these names were names that were built into uh, curricula for elementary school children, for eighth grade Georgia history. Um, I'm sure followed some students into their high school and college years if they stayed around this area. And, uh, and even reaching back to my own childhood, I can remember Georgia Day parades that, came, that ended right here at City Hall having come several squares north on, um, on Bull Street. And you know there are the ubiquitous and highly politically incorrect Kroger shopping bags that have been turned upside down and made into little Indian vests. You know the type I'm talking. If you're old enough, you know what I'm talking about. A um, you know, little fringe cut out and all of that. But um, so there, whoops. So Tomachichi is, is one of these familiar figures, but he's also probably perhaps one of the least completely fleshed out for us by way of biography, background, origins, and, uh, and his pivotal role as, uh, at the end of his life um, as far as an ally to um, help the Georgia colony actually survive. I think that it is not an overstatement to say that had James Oglethorpe encountered either neutrality or opposition from Tomachichi and the Yamacraw, around 200 Yamacraw uh, colleagues people of his, that the Georgia colony might not have even happened. It that might just be a footnote in, in the history books. You, you know, we, we can't play what if history uh, too successfully, but I don't think that that is, is unreasonable to say. So I hope that in the course of our few minutes together, you'll learn some things about Tomachichi maybe that you didn't know before. Um, the, I want to start with a little um, caveat or a, an asterisk. There are a lot of print sources that, that tend to be older sources than some online sources that put Tomachichi's possible birth date at 1650. But in preparation, so that's how this presentation got put together. But I should tell you also, in case you're interested in tracking these things, that there are some more current and online sources, chiefly uh, the New Georgia Encyclopedia 
And if you don't know about the New Georgia Encyclopedia, you should. Um, it is a, a project from the Georgia Humanities Council, and it employed humanities professionals, historians, and so forth from all over the state and really all over the country to write articles. Um, when, the, when the New Georgia Encyclopedia was first established, um, and I was working pretty closely with the leadership at the Georgia Humanities Council at that time, someone said, well, isn't it weird to call it the New Georgia Encyclopedia because it's not going to be new after, you know, it's had a few years. And the answer was a very clever one. It's going to be new because it's going to be changing constantly, right? New, new articles being, it's not like a set of encyclopedia that sits on your shelf, right? Th these are going to be new and innovative articles and even changes within existing articles as scholarship changes and reveals more information. So all of that long, boring prelude to say the New Georgia Encyclopedia and a few other more current sources have this year at 1644. So you do the math, whether it's 1644 or whether it's 1650. This is a person from the um, 17th and 18th centuries who lived to a ripe old age, right? He, he was in his 80s, perhaps late 80s, at the point of Oglethorpe's arrival on Yamacraw Bluff in 1733. So a lot of people who don't look at the numbers, don't look at the dates of birth and so forth, have the perception that Oglethorpe and Tomachichi were contemporaries. They were contemporaries in that they were living at the same time, but they were different generations. Oglethorpe was 36 years old when he arrived on Yamacraw Bluff, and we're talking about somebody 50 years older, at least. Okay, so that is out of the way. I thought it wouldn't um, hurt to, for you to see, we're not going to talk about all of these different groups, but um, I think too often we of, you know, Anglo-American stock tend to kind of lump Native American nations into one monolithic whole. And of course we know Cherokees, and of course we've heard the word Seminoles. Some of these have made their way into sports team names and that sort of thing. But it, I think it's helpful to see our state and then two neighboring states and the, the various um, Native American nations that comprised that area, that they were not a monolithic thing. They had their own languages, their own cultures, their own customs. And in many instances, they were forming, um, they were forming alliances with each other and they were fighting against each other. And then when you have the just add water moment of the European colonial powers coming in, and you know, the English were, were late to the scene, the Spaniards were, were in this part of the world quite early, the French not too long after them, and then finally the English, that these Native American groups were in a constant state of shifting alliances based on their own self-interest. That's the reason we enter into alliances, right? So whichever colonial power was not being hostile or was offering the best trade deals or was offering the most protection, whatever it was that, the, this, that one particular group or another had as its interest at the moment, then that would be the European power that that nation A, nation B, nation C would reach out to and try to, to work with. And these things were, were constantly shifting. So just a little bit of a, um, a, little bit of a, a tour of this um, map, the one of Georgia here. And you do realize how artificial it is for us to superimpose our state boundaries onto much, much, much older boundaries of nations. So realize that these curves and arcs and so forth didn't stop at the Georgia-Florida line. There was no Georgia-Florida line, right? When, when these, um, that's just an example. So if you look at the, uh, at the uh, Wale, do you see that G-U-A-L-E? -E? That's right where Savannah is today. That was a, a group that was, that was not Tomachichi's group. This is a, a group of Mississippian culture. And the Wale had their first European encounters in the 1500s in the form of Spanish Roman Catholic um, missionaries who would come, priests and, and some lay missionaries as well, who would come to try mainly to convert the, they would have called them pagans of the, of the new world. Um, if you look at the Yamasee, just to the south of where we saw the Wale, um, the first European encounter here is going to be in 1540, um, Hernando de Soto, um, who, and th this is a group, the Yamasee, and they, these were different than a lot of their neighbors. Um, they didn't generally tend to be a group of natives who would Christianize as easily. And we're going to talk a little bit more about education and conversion in the Christian religion through the filter of these Native American nations. I just want to plant a tiny seed of skepticism in your mind right now. I don't know how many of you are religious people. I don't need to know. But if someone, especially an invading foreign group, came and said, I just know that you want to convert from whatever your religion is to ours. I don't know that that's always met with warmth and hugs and, and you know, rainbows and unicorns, 
But what if the facts on the ground, what if your safety or survival were dependent? And I'm just suggesting that at least in some instances, when I tell you a group did Christianize, didn't Christianize, even the ones who did, there could be all kinds of different reasons other than some kind of personal religious experience, right, that would lead someone or a group to, um, to do that. And, and the Yamasee tended to stay um, rather separate from the... Um, from their, their Christianized uh, neighbors, even, no matter how sincere that Christianity was. In 1687, the Spaniards tried to enslave the Yamasee people and to send them to what really was the headline of the colonial new world, and that was the West Indies. It is a little bit of a, um, a dose of humility for those of us who live on the Atlantic seaboard to imagine that in, in the colonial world, in the world of European colonizing powers, that we on the Eastern seaboard were not the headline. We were the footnote. The, the real wealth came from the West Indies, came from the Caribbean, mainly because of sugar, the sugar trade and, and sugar culture. So Spaniards in 1687, as I said, tried to uh, enslave Yamasee people and send them to these sugar plantations in the, in the West Indies, and the Yamasee revolted. And we're going to see in just a little while that this was not the, this was not the last time that the Yamasee Indians would, um, would strike back at um, the, the powers that be. In fact, we might as well go ahead and jump to that right now. Um, in 1715, and of course by this time, we're not yet at a founding date for the colony of Georgia, but the colony of South Carolina, which encompassed a great deal of the land um, south of what today, south of the Savannah River, was claimed by South Carolina. This is one of the reasons that South Carolinians in the, in the act of 1733 and the years following in the trustee period were a little ornery when it came to Georgia, because not only were, was Georgia the poorest of all 13 of the colonies, haha, -ha, ostensibly here to, to provide military protection against, this, against the Spanish to protect the South Carolinians. The South Carolinians were far more able to protect themselves than the, the Georgians who were sort of hobbling along at that time. Yet to add insult to injury, this new colony of Georgia, which the South Carolinians saw as really not that valuable to them at all, took land away from South Carolina to create. So insulting there. But anyway, the South Carolinians had their own conflicts in the 1715 uh, Yamasee War. And this had to do with what I was saying earlier, these shifting alliances. So as South Carolina merchants attempted to exploit the Yamasees in the Lower Creeks, the Native Americans revolted. And they said, we're going to get a better deal from the French than we are from you. So we're going to shift alliances um, to, um, to them. And I want to take a second here to make another comment about the way that long time uh, traditional his history and historians have looked at Native American culture. Too often, in my opinion, the Native Americans and lots of others as well, I mean, we could talk about slave culture, we could talk about any number of different groups that have been seen by a, a white European elite as other, have tended to be in the history books, whether it's intentional or it's not intentional, have been seen to be acted upon. Right? They're, they're almost like set pieces, and then the Europeans do all of the acting. The Europeans do everything that requires volition. But I want you to think uh, during our entire time together today, and I hope I've already begun making the point, that these Native American nations had volition of their own. They had agency of their own. And they could make decisions like shifting alliances to another European power when it was in their best interest. When we narrow the focus to Tomachichi, and, and which we'll do right away, and to the Yamacross, particularly in the what I think is a really interesting episode in which Tomachichi and um, six or seven or eight other uh, Yamacraw Indians, Native Americans, go to England, they are on a mission of their own. They have a, an agenda. They have a list of things that they also want to accomplish. Okay, so here he is, the man, uh, Tomochichi, in exile. And, and here and there we have quotes, mainly in um, correspondence or recorded conversations. Uh, there's a wonderful resource at the Georgia Historical Society called the Colonial Record of Georgia. And some of it, of course, is intensely boring. It's like reading meeting minutes. But every now and then you get these little nuggets, right, of very interesting personality revealing episodes in, in Georgia history. And this, this is one of them. Um, Tomachichi said, I was a banished man. I came here, here being Yamacraw Bluff, just above the Savannah River, right where this building is, more or less, um, poor and helpless to look for good land near the tombs of my ancestors. Now, it's important to realize we didn't see, back on our map here, we did not see 
um, Yamacraw up there, did we? The Yamacraws were a very small subset of the Creek Nation. Now, there are some connections to the Wale, but primarily when you talk about the Yamacraws, you mean, you're talking about uh, a break off from the, the Creeks. And what remains rather a mystery to historians then, historians today, is why Tomochichi and his 200 kinsmen had separated from the Creeks in the first place. We don't know if they had done something wrong. We don't know if there was some challenge to the larger Creek authority. We don't know if they just wanted a different life. And people separate from groups of people all the time. And we don't really know uh, what was going on there. He does not seem to have been a diminutive leader. Like, they didn't leave because they were weak, uh, we don't think. But, um, but in any event, um, that, was, um, that was the case. He, uh, he'd settled here on the Savannah River, Yamacraw Bluff. No matter the details, um, Tomachichi, at his advanced age, was not a neophyte to the relations with white. It is absolutely wrong to think of Tomachichi and any of his people meeting James Oglethorpe, and those are the first white people they'd ever seen. Tomochichi had been to South Carolina. Georgia, as a colony, has had several advantages for being the baby of the family, right? You learn a lot about the mistakes of 150 years prior in the foundings of Massachusetts, the founding of Virginia, the founding of, even of South Carolina. And so there are agreements and treaties that, um, that predate the Georgia founding. For example, um, 1721, there's already a treaty in place between English colonists and, and, and segments of the Creek Nation from 1721. And these are just some of the, we won't go through these painstakingly, but um, again, this is an, an effort on the part of the Creeks to establish themselves and to have rights of their own. That English who would wrong the Creeks are to be judged and punished in the English system. So there's going to be some retribution if you treat Native peoples um, badly. The Creeks will be given ammunition to use against their enemies as long as those enemies are not allies of the English. So here are some weapons, but don't use them against us. Right? Creeks are to protect English goods and traders out on the edges of the frontier, outside of the protection of the cities. This kind of protection for white people was important. And you could enlist that among natives if you, um, if you observe the terms of these treaties. Um, the English trade rates were to be fixed so that it's not shifting ground. Well, you know, these deer skin brought, brought me this much last week. How, how about let's have some standardization of these, um, of these elements. This is an interesting one. Threatened with slavery themselves from time to time, Native Americans would sometimes agree to return escaped slaves to their, to their masters. Creeks would stay out of English settlements unless they sought permission to be there. Um, no more dealings with the Spaniards. The Spaniards, of course, are the headline enemy for the English in this lower part of the, whoops, in this lower part of the um, uh, Atlantic seaboard. And then a verbal assurance, this is the killer right here, verbal assurance for no more English settlements south or west of the Savannah River. Think about that. Where is Savannah located? Yeah. So the city of Savannah was actually in violation of this, but nevertheless. So what about Tomachichi's initial encounter with Oglethorpe? Well, in keeping with the terms of the agreement that we just saw, Oglethorpe asked permission from Tomachichi before settling on Yamacraw Bluff. And maybe that was just a courtesy. Maybe that's what Oglethorpe was intending to happen regardless. But the fact is that he asked, he didn't tell. And Tomachichi said, yes, that will be fine. We will make, we will make room. So this is 1733. Um, I've already mentioned the idea of, of agency on the part of the native peoples. And the best book, it's got a little bit of age on it at this point, but the best book that I can recommend to you that is, that is told and couched from the, from the position of agency and volition of the native peoples is this book by Julianne Sweet. She is a, it's a UGA Press publication, but she is a um, professor of history at Baylor University in Texas. And in 2005, she published Negotiating for Georgia, British Creek Relations in the Trusty Era. Uh, so it goes only from the 1730s to the 1750s. And in this book, Dr. Sweet asks questions like, were they really negotiating? Was it a meaningful negotiation in which each side had some power in the negotiation? And she, the answer is yes, by the way. She believes that each side had leverage, had ways that they could make their own hopes and dreams come, through, come, come true. So conquest, contact, or negotiation, varying understandings of interaction between European powers and native peoples cause occasional controversy. And those, that controversy usually comes when, again, the native peoples are the ones who are the two-dimensional cardboard cutouts and who aren't 
operating of their own volition. And, and so um, when we talk about um, requests or, or demands even on the part of the natives to the, um, the newly arrived um, European settlers, we, we deal in things like safety and protection, usually from other Native American groups or from other colonizing powers, questions of fairness and trade, uh, questions of weapons and ammunition as well. So this is often something that the Native groups want. And then, as I've already um, indicated or hinted at, this question of religious instruction. Is that a valid and genuine request, or is that something seen as easing tension, greasing the wheels, making things happen a little more. It's a, is it truly religion or is it more just we're going to adopt these customs on a surface level so that we all get along um, better? So Accord in Georgia, this is a, I hope you all realize that Georgia's history with its Native American neighbors is the smoothest and most peaceful of all of the other stories. King Philip's War, 17th century Massachusetts, deadly, horrible lives lost on both sides. We already talked about the Yamasee War that was much, much closer in South Carolina. There are no such examples of outright hostilities between the founders and the settlers of Georgia and their Native American, their Native American neighbors. Uh, so the Articles of Friendship and Commerce signed in May 1733. This is just a few months after the um, founding of the colony in the first place. And who knew that Georgia had a first Thanksgiving? Um, July 7th, mind you, that would be a different experience, wouldn't it, in the same year. And Oglethorpe seems to have had a genuine affinity, I might even say love or affection, for Tomochichi. He said in his letters, I am a red man, I am an Indian in my heart, that is why I love them. Now, you don't get too much more specific than that in showing affection for someone who is very, very different culturally and ethnically than you, than to say, I am one of you. I am one, I feel like I am one of you. What did Tomochichi have to say in response? In a, in a moment of, of controversy that we, where weapons were, were pulled out, there were some, there were some unconvinced uh, Native Americans in the, in the area, and he, Tomochichi, the story goes, stood between Oglethorpe and the aggressor and said, shoot me. If you desire to kill anyone, kill me, I'm an Englishman. These did not happen in the same scene, but we have Oglethorpe saying, I'm one of you, and we have Tomochichi saying, I'm one of you, all right? It, it's pretty much a model of, of um, friendship. So Georgia is founded in, uh, on, on February 12, 1733, and in March of 1734, there needed to be a trip for Oglethorpe back to England. Um, Georgia, the Georgia colony was a little bit over a year old. I should have put the very famous and really ubiquitous Peter Gordon drawing, that baby picture of Savannah, right, that shows the really undeveloped Yamacraw Bluff, but there's already lines and property um, divisions and so forth, and you can definitely see the Oglethorpe plan um, coming to fruition there. That, think, about, think about that Peter Gordon drawing as a visual aid that Oglethorpe had done to take back to England as a, as a visual, as, as exhibit A, for the reports that he was making to his fellow Georgia trustees, to people who were interested, who sat in parliament. Oglethorpe went back to England basically to give a progress report on the success, needs, et cetera, of the Georgia colony. There was also a significant fundraising effort behind that visit as well. Money was always, always, always a problem for the Georgia colony, and so Oglethorpe was always looking for additional sponsors, additional government grants from Parliament, where King's grants, whatever he could get to finance, um, better finance the goals of the, of the calling. So in addition to just words and a drawing of Savannah, he took people with him too, who, I have to tell you, were an absolute rock star level sensation in London. Many people in London had never seen anyone who looked different than, than they did, right? So these brown skinned people from the exotic place of North America, the Yamacraw Bluff, uh, were a sensation. Tomachichi, his wife, Sanauki, their nephew, they had no children of their own. So they had a nephew whom they adopted as their heir, as his heir, and his name was Tunahawi, and a, a handful of other warriors from the, um, from the Yamacraw uh, nation. So off they went to visit England, and they were feted everywhere they went. And how do we know this? You can read London newspapers 
from 1734, and their every move is written about, where they went, whom they met, what they did for entertainment. Uh, it's, it, it's a very minute by minute, it's like Madonna was in town, you know, a really, really um, significant amount of documentary evidence. So let me give you a little sampling of where they, where they went. For starters, they went to Westbrook Place. Um, you may or may not, that may not, not mean anything to you. This is Oglethorpe's birthplace. So Oglethorpe basically took his Native American friends back home to meet the family, right? Um, London was their home base. This is in the county of Surrey, which is a bit out from London, still in striking distance of London. And this is the home where, where Oglethorpe was born. You can still visit this place today. It's still standing. It is not a home anymore. Well, it's kind of a home. It is a medical facility that is a, um, a, a hospital for people who suffer from epilepsy. And it, apart from the, um, the trees and so forth look different, and there's also pictures of this that covered with um, ivy, like vines all over the building, and that's not the case anymore. But the building looks pretty much like this today. And if you get permission to go in, which isn't easy to do, it feels very clinical inside. It's a lot of white linoleum and fluorescent lighting and you know, that kind of thing. But it looks like this. So um, Oglethorpe took the group um, to, to his home, you know, his home base. He also took them to meet, appropriately enough, the other trustees of the Georgia colony. You probably all know that Oglethorpe was one of the trustees, but he was the only one who physically accompanied any colonists to Yamacraw Bluff to establish Georgia. The other of these people were, were wealthy business people. They were, they were aristocrats. They were philanthropists. And here they all are. You can probably, is there a laser pointer on this? Let's see. Oh, that's not what I want to do. There may not be. It's, oh, in the center. So do you see Oglethorpe right there? This is Oglethorpe, and then the, we won't bother naming, I couldn't even name all of them, but um, Oglethorpe is here, and it's pro probably fairly obvious to you where the group of Native Americans are. Can you, um, can you see that they brought a bald eagle with them as a gift? They also brought an enormous bear skin with them as a gift. They, they came bearing gifts in addition to their own company. I think it's interesting to note that um, some of them are in their native costumes, their native clothing, but others are in English clothing. And I don't really know the reasons that some made one choice, some made the other. There was a fair amount of consternation among English society at the, let's just say the amount of flesh that was exposed in you know, this was a question of real, you know, question of propriety in some cases. So some of the people put on European clothing, other people didn't. Here's Tuna Howie down here in a very English looking, looking um, bit of clothing. And um, the, um, this, this image, uh, which is in the Winterthur collection, is take, it's taken, it's painted in the, um, the Georgia office, which is in the grounds of Westminster in London. And the Georgia office is a building that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, I don't know if it was torn down or if it burned down, but um, a great uh, Georgia history scholar who passed away a few years ago, Dr. Ed Cashin, did some fairly interesting triangulation to figure out where the Georgia office was. And he did it by looking at the Houses of Parliament through the window. So he found that view and then stood where that view would, you would see that. From. So he figured, and I've actually been with him in London where he showed all of that to a group and um, so we stood on where the Georgia office was. And incidentally, while the, um, the visiting Native Americans were in London, the attic of the Georgia office was where they lived. So it was the Georgia office as well as a lodging um, place. I already mentioned that um, these, uh, these folks were, were taken around to meet all kinds of people and we might, we'll go right to the top. They met the king and queen. They were presented to the king and queen, King George II, who in 1732 had granted the Georgia Charter to Oglethorpe and the other trustees, and his wife, Queen Caroline, for whom the Carolinas are, are named. Um, we don't see a young man in these portraits, but their youngest son, Prince William Augustus, the Duke of Cumberland, was on hand. Um, his age at the time was 13. And we don't know exactly how old Tuna Howie was, but he was reasonably close to that age. So the two boys were put together to meet one another and to have a ceremonial exchange of gifts. Um, what the Duke of Cumberland gave to young Tuna Howie was a, a copy of the New Testament. There's again that underlying learn the 
Christian faith idea, a New Testament and a pocket watch that was made of gold. This is quite a valuable gift to be, to be giving. And the words that accompanied that gift were, this pocket watch is for you so that you can look at it and that you may think of Jesus Christ at every hour of the day. Okay, um, so off to know how he went with these very valuable gifts. This is ancillary to our subject today, but the young Prince William Augustus, Duke of Cumberland, does that name mean anything to you? Just a few years later, uh, another 12 years from this visit in 1734, 1746 is the Battle of Culloden, uh, in which the Jacobites were rising, the Scottish um, uh, proponents were rising up against English rule. And so if you go to Scotland today, you can visit the battlefield of Culloden. The Duke of Cumberland was especially violent as that battle went through and killed wounded soldiers on the battlefield instead of taking them prisoners. So he, he got the, um, this young guy giving away New Testaments and gold pocket watches, um, gets the, the nickname the Butcher, Butcher Cumberland, the Butcher of Culloden, um, it, just in a, in a few years later. The Native Americans also made some religious, specifically religious visits. Um, they visited Lambeth Palace, which is in London. It's, it's in Suffolk on the south bank of the River Thames, and it is the London residence of the Archbishop of Canterbury. So the Native Americans are meeting, and they're being presented to the highest ranking official in the Church of England. Um, and this man, William Walker, had that, that office at the time. He was very elderly, very old, and did not live much longer, but he did meet. Tomachichi and others. Uh, they made royal visits along the River Thames um, to Hampton Court Palace and to Windsor Castle. Um, if you've ever been to Hampton Court Palace, then you know that it has a strong association with King Henry VIII. Um, you might have learned that from one of, goodness, those TV miniseries that are all about long time. Hampton Court Palace is one of, I can't remember what the name of the the, the Tudors, probably. Hampton Court Palace plays significantly in the, in the series called The Tudors. And so already in the 1730s, King Henry VIII is two centuries earlier, and there's a significant collection of armor uh, that belonged to Henry VIII that's still today on display. You can go see this. This is a modern day uh, picture. I don't want to be crude, but rumor has it that some of the women, including Sanaki, who was the wife of Tomochichi, were actually a little embarrassed and blushed and covered their faces when they saw this particular piece of armor. And um, the comment that they made as they rushed away was, I guess now we understand why he needed so many wives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. a, little bit of, um, a little bit of tragedy as well um, struck the group. It, a num it is a miracle, if, if you believe in such things, that all of these Native Americans did not perish from European diseases, uh, from which Native Americans often were utterly unprepared and, and unable to, to fight. Um, smallpox was the leading cause of death um, when at the point of European and Native American encounter. And indeed, one of these Creek warriors died of smallpox. And his, his uh, funeral was held at this church, um, the Church of St. John the Evangelist in Smith Square, Westminster. You can still visit this building today. It has been deconsecrated. It is no longer a church, but it's a performance space. So you can go there and in any given night, there's probably some kind of classical music um, presentation or um, recital going on at St. John the Evangelist. I don't have a picture of this, I don't think, but um, I will tell you that um, the Native American, of course, you know, the days before embalming, refrigeration, et cetera, you die in London, you're gonna be buried in London. And so he was funeralized here at this church, and then the funeral procession went to, it's out of the square, it's a little bit of a walk um, to the, the former burying ground of this church. And that's where this uh, warrior was buried. And the London newspapers are just filled with all kinds of interesting details about the funeral rites and the customs, because he was buried in the manner of his people, not in, in the manner of the Anglicans. And so a shroud burial, beads, food, things like that, in, in that belief structure, the things he would need in the, the next world. Um, so you can read all of that. Um, a kind of sad story um, occurred when this church was deconsecrated, so was the cemetery. And I don't know what generation that was, what century that was, but it was long enough ago that the respect that I would say that we in the current day would bring to a cemetery kind of setting was not yet in anybody's mind. The, the slate markers that had marked the graves of this, as soon as the cemetery was deconsecrated, these um, markers were just pulled up out of the ground turned face down and they became the pathways of a park. And today it's a park. 
and you can walk through, and if you, you would get in trouble for doing this, but if you were to pry up any of these big pieces of slate, dollars to donuts, there are going to be inscriptions on the bottom side of them. So where exactly this burial is, it is in that cemetery, but we, or that park, but we don't know exactly where. So what is it exactly that Tomachichi and his, um, and his colleagues were asking for on this really important trip to England where they were able to voice their own concerns and their own requests? Well, here's the sampling. Uh, that there should be a regulated system of weights and measures. Let's get these things uniform for the purposes of trade so that we are not going to be cheated when we are bringing things that we want to sell. Um, traders should be licensed and regulated. Mary Musgrove, you'll remember, had a trading post. And you can find evidence of Mary Musgrove continually bickering with other people about her rights to trade and are they licensed because she's licensed? And just all of this sort of one-upsmanship that we find all through the colonial record. Stores should be set up in all principal towns so that Native Americans can be provided. Give us places to buy things is what Tomachichi and his friends were basically saying there. There should be a system of redress and uh, restitution for cheated Native Americans. Give us an avenue to call out bad behavior and to have something. It's not a court exactly, but give us the opportunity for arbitration they were asking for. There should be no, this is a really interesting one. There should be no rum sold to Native Americans. This is Tomachichi and company saying, let's put some rules into place that do not allow the English to sell us alcohol, strong alcohol. They could beer and wine, but, but strong alcohol. And that should ring a bell to you. You know, we all hear, if we live in Savannah long enough, that Oglethorpe didn't want Catholics, lawyers, rum. So Oglethorpe was right on that page. He didn't think that strong spirits should have a place in Georgia at all for Native Americans or for anybody else. Whoops. Uh, the English should provide teachers for the Native American children for the purposes of learning English and for converting to Christianity. And again, we've already said that enough. Tomachichi and Oglethorpe did not leave England at the same time. T Oglethorpe had more work to do and the visit by the Native Americans was about six months in duration. And when you think about a, a transatlantic crossing that could be six weeks, six months is about how long you want to stay, right? Oglethorpe stayed for another six months or so beyond that. And there's a very touching exchange by Tomachichi in October of 1734 when he left. He said, I'm glad to be going home. Remember, remember his advanced age here as well. Um, I'm glad to be going home, but to part with you is like the day of death. You have never made a difference between our people and your people. You have never broken a promise to us. When I die, I want to be buried in the white man's town and not in the forest. Again, in keeping with this theme of you are like me, I'm like you, we are the same. This is remarkable and this is very different than most other um, experiences of similar um, quality in other parts of the seaboard. So once Oglethorpe came back to Georgia, there were renewed problems and aggression between the Yamasee and the Spanish coalition with the Creeks. And Oglethorpe and Tomachichi go to St. Simon's Island. They're, they're getting down there close to where the Spaniards are uh, in 1738. And um, in, in writing to um, Tomachichi to go actually to the frontier with him, keep in mind again the advanced age here, Oglethorpe just basically says, I need your help. I need you to, to help me with this with this possible aggression with the Spaniards. And Tomachichi says, I am too old now and can only be your advisor. But these men, 1,000 Creek warriors, are ready and willing to serve you and to go where you command. Now, I ask you, 1,000 warriors are not going to help Oglethorpe because Oglethorpe said so. They're going to help because Tomachichi said so. So again, when I say an ally of the Georgia colony, pretty specifically, uh, he was an ally. So what about Tomachichi's death? Well, John Wesley, the Anglican minister who served in Savannah in, in the late 1730s, George Whitfield, um, they had both visited uh, the aging and dying Tomachichi. But Tomachichi finally dies on September the 22nd, 1739. Oglethorpe got there too late because he'd been in Augusta uh, recovering from an injury of his own. And um, I'll remind us that, uh, that Tomachichi had asked to be buried in the white man's town. And by every piece of documentary evidence that we have, that is exactly what happened. Uh, that it was called Percival Square back then. We call it Wright Square today. 
that there was, in the tiny little town of Savannah, Oglethorpe ordered a full military procession and burial for his Native American friend and ally. And so Tomachichi is buried in the middle of Percival Square, today called Wright Square. And there was a monument erected to him, to his honor, in 1739. Now, I have this grainy, difficult to see photograph here, but it's a really important photograph. Conventional wisdom for years and years and years has been that this kind of truncated pyramid that's covered in vines was, was the monument that Oglethorpe had erected to Tomachichi's honor and memory with this urn and what looked like some maybe palm fronds in it or something like that. And so for the longest time, everybody believed that that was the, the, the monument and that it was there until it was destroyed to make room for the monument that's in Wright Square today, which is the monument to William Washington Gordon the I, the founder of the Central of Georgia Railroad and the bringer of a lot of prosperity and financial security to Georgia as it was finally able to compete in the, in the 1830s and 1840s with the established railroad in South Carolina. It didn't quite happen that way, apparently. That Tomachichi's monument disappeared off of the maps long before the Gordon Monument was put there. So that rather relieves the people who are behind the building of the Gordon Monument in the 1880s of direct responsibility for knocking down one monument and putting theirs instead. Apparently more years el elapsed than, than just that. It doesn't mean the Tomachichi's monument wasn't destroyed. It obviously was because it wasn't there anymore. But my friend and professor at SCAD, Robin Williams, has found on maps through the 19th century these decorative stone and vegetation clumps, for lack of a better word. There are about six of them in the middle of different squares all in the, in the, the landmark district, including this one. So Robin Williams doubts that what we're seeing in this photograph is the monument to Tomachichi. He thinks it was already gone by this time. In, in, in any event, it's definitely gone now because we know what's there now. But there's no evidence that Tomachichi's remains were ever moved. So probably what we have is a burial site with two more generations of something above, above it. But here's what Robin says beyond that. And this is amazingly, I don't know, I found this very nice and encouraging and a good place to probably come to a close on our talk here. And that is that 1739, if there indeed was a monument to Tomachichi established there by James Oglethorpe, that is probably the first monument to anybody in British North America. It, you know, it predates anything that would be in the American Revolution, right? It predates any monuments to any white people that would be anywhere in New England or anywhere along the Eastern Seaboard, Middle Atlantic, anywhere. And isn't it wonderful that quite likely the very first monument erected and dedicated to anyone by European hands in North America. First of all, it was in Georgia. That's nice. And secondly, it was to a person of color, which I think is nice as well. Um, so here we are. The only other things that I have here to show you are Tomachichi's marker that, that we get in 1899, courtesy of the colonial dames in Georgia. And it's this big naturalistic looking hunk of granite boulder um, from North Georgia, and it's off to the side, it's off in the corner. And then there's a, there is a historical marker right in front of the um, Gordon Monument identifying that spot as Tomachichi's grave. And then um, finally, something that you may or may not have seen, but there is a representation of this great friendship in a stained glass window in, uh, I think it's in Christ Church um, in St. Simon's Island. So here is, uh, here's Oglethorpe, and we have Tomachichi over here, and of course the young uh, Tuna Howie is here. So um, not in Savannah, but in, nearby, we have a um, stained glass representation of the, of the figures in this um, chapter. That is where we're going to end, but I would be glad to try to answer any questions if you, if you have them. And I appreciate your coming today. Yes, sir. Hi, I, I just want to know, um, you know, based off of you saying that there was shared agency and seemingly power in those early days, which mm -hmm. I mean, that was more of an indication of just regular law firm practices during sure. that time period anyway, so that wasn't necessarily anything peculiar to Oglethorpe or Tomachichi or Georgia. But um, in light of that, do you have any references of the kind of um, missionism that the Yamacraw did for the English? 
and what were the successes? Were the Gamma Corp equally as strident or as successful at missionizing English people and their religion? When you said, no, no, uh -huh. no, no. I, and I thought that's what you meant by missionizing, you know, like missionary conversion efforts, that kind of right, thing? because what I'm saying is that if the, the, the ground statement is that, you know, there was shared agency and there was this interplay within the early Wampum South, mm -hmm. which meant that we share, we are co-sovereign, which we know obviously wasn't the truth. Um, were and I didn't there mean instances to of Native American people being either convert or missionized whites? Because if indeed Oglethorpe said he was one of them, right. I would suspect that that would have some weight, perhaps on other whites who would look into their religions in ways the same way. Second part of my question is, can you tell me, in light of the same declaration about equal agency, can you give me a map or reference also for maps of lands in England that Yamacraw now own or control or have no. or their dominion, like, you know, the English at least up to 17. No, of course not. Okay, so I, I guess it, in a way it's a sort of, it's not veiled, it's pretty open. It's a challenge to the statement about equal and open agency, particularly without the subtext being an understanding of basic wampum culture in the early days of the Republic to become because the way Native American people dealt with Illinois, Iroquois um, Confederacy being maybe a substrate for it or Gaiana that understanding there was a thought of co sovereignty in things. And apparently, the English never had that in mind, no matter how much they said they loved. And apparently, by where we are today, and I look in the room, I don't think too many Yamacraw people are here, and I don't know of any Yamacraw townships and ownerships and power and things. So, something is a you very much. Also, just to, and I'm sorry for being long-winded, uh, there's another painting, actually it's in Savannah, of uh, Tomachichi and his um, son or nephew, nephew, and Oglethorpe, this was painted off the wall by SCAD, um, and it's on Barnard Street. It was painted down. It was I had no idea. Street. Actually, it was commissioned by the Georgia Historical Society. It was still painted off the wall. But right. still that out. Okay. Thank you. Do you know what happened to the Yamakras after Tomochichi died? Did they stay around here, or did they move? In their very small numbers, I, I don't know how long mm -hmm. they survived, but I am not aware of any, any extraction of that okay. culture today at all. And of course, you know, we're less than 100 years away, even at the time of Oglethorpe, less than 100 years away from the forcible removal right. yes. of Native peoples from Georgia during the Andrew Jackson administration yes. primarily, Trail of Tears. Yeah. That was primarily aimed at the Cherokee who had a much, much stronger and more noticeable presence in Georgia by that time. Um, and then so most of those people, if they survived, ended up in, what is today, Oklahoma. So they could have maybe gone in with another Entirely group. possible. Okay. Yes, yes, right. exactly. Of course. Are they, Luciana? Um, I just was going to um, provide a little information on the mounds that you should mm -hmm. picture of. Yeah. So, there is documentation in the city archives from like the 1870s where those um, those decorative mounds and urns were installed and there's some indication that they possibly were installed um, through the, the um, leadership or encouragement of an alderman that was trying to keep street guards from running through the square. So they are much later, they are 1870s, the particular one that you saw um, photographed there. Um, and they are just sort of earthen mounds, decorative with a decorative plan on mm -hmm. yes. I want to go back to the gentleman's comments, if I could, just for a second, to make sure that I was clear. I don't, I did not intend to use the word equal agency. I don't think I used the word equal. Um, what I was trying to convey is that in traditional historical treatments of these moments of encounter, too often it has seen, all right, let me use a totally different example that is equally wrong. Um, when you talk about, when historians have talked, historic, have talked about the Holocaust, a frequently used phrase about the victims of the Holocaust, whether they were Jews or they were some other victimized group, was that they were led like sheep to the slaughter, which completely robs them of any volition anything they did to resist, anything that they did to lay down something, even if it was utterly unequal, but they, did, they didn't just do nothing. And so too often if we transpose that story 
to the story of European colonization and native peoples who were already in North America. It seems like the only people who had the gumption to do anything were the white people, and that's simply not true. Were they on equal footing? Absolutely they were not. Was there mistreatment? Absolutely there was mistreatment, white to Native American. Almost always it was in that direction. But my effort and the efforts of more contemporary historians is simply to say, these were not people who were merely acted upon. They had brains, they had experiences, they had, they had things with which to bargain. And they, they achieved certain small things in, in their own right and for their own best interest. Yes? But don't you think also that even in the fact that that has to be asserted, that that does a certain sort of damage on its own as a sort of force of narrative, the fact that we have to think of either Native people or Africans too, sure, of uh, course. being people who had agency because apparently there wasn't or uh, isn't still, I would say to this day, I would say, the kind of um, um, archive and exposition of that archive at this present time. No and question like about story. it. And in fact, this town has been indicted quite, quite you know, frontally by, what is it, in, what is that report? It's a new report that South says Savannah has done a very poor job, and a prime concern here is to, in fact, raise these things that mm -hmm. you're talking about, that I'm talking about, right. to the highest level. Um, and to raise those things to the highest level, you have to actually do that. Mm -hmm. And there has to be some... Um, I, I guess um, interrogation, if not analysis of the kind of language. So again, I'm saying even to have to propose that we must take a step back to think that people had agency as people or as equals or asserted themselves as human beings means that there's a big loss that needs to be addressed in how we think about who we are yeah. as people and other people. I agree with you, and I believe I, so I, I, I I've, I'm saying there's a great, it's almost like a greater impulse or thing that, that has to happen outside of just the factual representation. I can tell you what I think the motivation is mm -hmm. on the part of contemporary historians when they take this step that you and I are talking about to, to acknowledge and to find documentary evidence that demonstrates this agency. I think more than, more than a statement on the events of the 1730s, I think it is a righting the wrongs of the last hundred years of scholarship. It's like these, these issues have been ignored or they have been misrepresented. Let's be honest, all to the benefit of the white conqueror. And so in the last 25 years, the last 30 years, I think there's been an effort on the part of serious historians to say our profession has gotten it wrong for too long and we're gonna to try to right some of those wrongs in our storytelling. On the psychological side, just as a person of color, myself, and also with Native African background, and European too, um, because that's the thing. Um, why should we think that if it's been done wrong that long, and the agency's been on the part of other people creating that wrong, that now we would wait for those same people to correct that in the time that they feel is appropriate to correct it, or even in the terms they feel appropriate. It seems like there should be more voice of those other people in the category of either exposition, understanding, or analysis. And I, definitely, I don't see that today represented in the room or represented in the things that I've seen around town yet. I'm not saying it can't happen or won't, but like, how do we make that happen? Because it seems like mm -hmm. that's the most crucial thing that has to happen. Well, some, not enough, but some of the historians who are, who are reevaluating and reinterpreting the kinds of things that I'm talking about, some of those people are people of color. And the, the academy cries out for more scholarship from people of color and wishes, <laughs> wishes, really wishes that more minorities would enter the profession. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a PhD candidate. I know what I'm going through with those people. Um, so I'm thinking, I don't know, again, about trust. And, I can only and, speak and from... Actually, and that actually happening. I think it, it's another kind of, it's, it's like something that has to go along with the history is what I'm saying, and I don't see that yet, and it seems to be a crucial part of what must go along yeah. with the history. But admittedly, yeah. I can speak only from my individual experiences and, and research and, and the work I've done in universities, that's, that's all, I have one person's eyes, you know, that's it. Yes, sir. Um, I, I just from, from the talk that you gave today, I, I did appreciate the bringing up that whole aspect of um, you know, the, the 
history. And, uh, and I uh, think that the biggest problem with that is that there's just not stuff there. It's just gone. It was gone. It was wiped away, and it's gone. And and how to how to try to find it or bring it back or it's just impossible. There, there's no I question. I do historical tours yeah. every day, in a, in the slave quarters at one of the museums. And I, you know, I always tell people uh, show them the bricks that were made on the plantations by the slaves. It reminds us they did all the work back then, pretty much all of it, and that that we always like to stop for a minute to give them some credit for all that work that they did do that they never got credit for. And it wasn't just out on plantations and picking cotton and all. It was building the cities all up and down the coast for sure. when the countries and uh, when all this stuff was being settled. In fact, in Georgia and in Savannah, they borrowed slaves from South Carolina to come and build the town. Yeah. It was like, you can't have slaves, but, you know, we got to get the town built, so, yeah. you know, we're going to borrow some. Yeah. And I just make sure that people know that it, New York at one time had the biggest number of slaves per capita than any of the other states up and down. But the cotton gin, that's what happened. Right. The cotton right. gin was invented. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, it is a shame. I mean, there's a lot of stuff we just don't know. We just don't know. And so it's hard to I, say. I don't want to cut us off because I think this is good discussion. So anybody that wants to stay after, but I, I see some people need to step out. So I want to make sure why everybody's here that we um, thank Roger for his time. And then if anybody does want to stay after to discuss more, that, that that's fine. Um, if you have a few minutes, can you fill out your survey? We do appreciate that feedback. And um, let me know um, if you want to come to the September program. Appreciate it. Thank you.